So, welcome back students. So, um, continuing with our inorganic base chemical. So, in the previous module we have already studied the sulfuric acid, sulfur as the elemental compound and sulfuric acid and this current module, module 3 we have already also seen the another example which is the nitric acid, um, nitrogen as the base element I would say instead of chemical. So, after this we go forward and we go to phosphoric acid. So, here phosphorus is the element. So, as I told you these are the inorganic base chemical. So, these account a substance, subsistence part I mean a substantial part for the total production worldwide. So, my thing is that we use both the sulphur, nitrogen as well as this phosphorus for primarily, primarily for the use of fertilizer. So, for the phosphoric acid what we will do is we will see some processes. The first one in this lecture we will see the dihydrate process. So, initially I will introduce what is the phosphorus element and then we go to the phosphoric acid and we see its process of the flow sheet. So, we discuss about the raw materials from where phosphorus is mined. Then the production processes for the phosphoric acid. We have several production processes for phosphoric acid. Uh, like the dihydrate process, hemihydrate process, the recrystallization process. So, we will discuss all those processes briefly. So, this particular lecture will be focused primarily on the dehydrate process. So, we will discuss the principle of dehydrate process and finally, we stop by discussing the flow sheet. So, now phosphorus as you know is a very important element. So, it is usually found in it is a plant nutrient okay? because plant nutrient a plant requires this phosphorus and from this phosphorus it is used for making phosphoric acid. But the source of phosphorus may be different. Source of phosphorus may be from some ore which we will discuss and uh, from the ore we can either get elemental phosphorus directly or we can get the phosphoric acid directly either way whichever you want elemental phosphorus can be again be combusted to form the phosphorus pentoxide which is again one of the desired product. But the conventional way of production producing phosphoric acid is primarily by contacting with sulfuric acid. So, let us first discuss phosphorus. So, as you know the phosphorus has two allotropes the yellow form and the red form. Yellow phosphorus is not that stable this thermally at all not at all stable neither to oxidation as well. So, if you heat the yellow phosphorus the melting point is around 44.1 degree Celsius. If you heat it, it will convert to the red phosphorus. The red phosphorus is having a melting point of 593 degree Celsius. So, red has a higher stability and more resistance to oxidation and can be obtained by heating yellow phosphorus. So, what is the method for manufacturing phosphorus in general? directly because this phosphorus is not a part of our syllabus, but I think you should know uh, briefly. So, how this phosphorus is obtained. So, usually this is the electrochemical process for manufacture. I will not go into the details of the electrochemical process, but the basic uh, expression or basic equation is that you have the silica, the sand and you have the calcium phosphate. This is the ore. When the ore is mined, it is treated with silica and carbon as the reducing agent. So, you what you do is you get a gas mixture of carbon monoxide and elemental phosphorus along with a slag material that is called calcium silicate. Fine. So, the entire equation is balanced. So, the phosphorus and carbon monoxide comes out of the furnace as gases. It is actually passed through a precipitator. Why it is passed through a precipitator? To remove the dust particles. Huh? So, you remove the dust particles. Remove dust particles. Remove the dust particles and then it is sprayed with water. So, cold water is sprayed. So, what happens is phosphorus separates out, phosphorus is condensed, it will separate out and is taken out, but, but you know you cannot uh, condense carbon monoxide. The con carbon monoxide escapes as a gas. So, you have two streams coming out after you spray. One is the carbon monoxide as gas and you know the carbon monoxide has several uses. In syngas, it is one of the primary components. So, carbon monoxide can be uh, reacted with hydrogen to get alcohols. So, it is a useful fuel and you get the elemental phosphorus. This is a way of manufacturing of the phosphorus element. Now, let us go what how to manufacture the phosphoric acid. So, usually phosphorus is derived as I discussed 
on the plant roots and in the form of dihydrogen phosphate, this is the formula. The phosphorus being an inorganic base chemical is mainly manufactured through the thermal process. So, thermal process is something where you get elemental phosphorus and from the elemental phosphorus you do oxidize and get the weak and colorless acid. However, this has some issues concerning the yield and also the type of the phosphate ore it can handle. It does not handle all types of phosphate ore. So, this method has been discarded. So, the new method or the conventional method which industry use is the wet process. So, most of the production takes place through the wet process. What is mean wet? Why do you mean wet? It means that the phosphate rock or the mineral is decomposed with an acid. So, the phosphate rock when reacts with the acid, it will form the, we are not getting direct phosphoric acid, we get something which is called phosphorus pentoxide P2O5. The P2O5 is in contact with water to get phosphoric acid. So, whenever I talk about phosphoric acid, it means I am talking about the different strengths of phosphorus pentoxide. So, the outcome of this reaction is you have the phosphorus pentoxide which is in contact with water to form phosphoric acid and the gypsum. Gypsum you know is calcium sulphate. So, gypsum can exist in various forms. It can have, it can exist with a mole of, two moles of water or it can that is called dihydrate. It can also exist at half mole of water that is called hemihydrate or it can exist in both forms. So, several processes exist which may produce dihydrate, which may produce hemihydrate based on the economics. So, we will see those. So, but uh, other than the sulfuric acid, the other acids are also involved. You can use nitric acid, hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is the conventional one which we will discuss. We can also use nitric and hydrochloric acid. The storage and transportation does not depend on the method of production. So, whether you use wet process or other thermal process, which anyway it is discarded, so, it, it will not affect the transportation. So, let us see what are the physical properties of phosphoric acid, uh, phosphoric acid, molar mass, density, boiling point, melting point and finally, the formula. So, you need H3PO4. So, this H3PO4 will have certain percentage of P2O5. So, this P2O5, it is a, you know, it is a orthophosphoric acid you must have heard. So, it is part, it takes the form of a particular shape, hexagonal shape. So, from there, it gets that uh, formula. Now, H3PO4 we is actually the acid form when it is with water. So, we will uh, mind primarily when we meet phosphoric acid, we will write this particular molecular formula, else we will always refer to P2O5. Now, what are the uses of phosphoric acid? As just now I told you this nitrogen, phosphorus and sulphur, these are the ones which are used for making fertilizers. What are the fertilizers? Uh, you have read it earlier also in your plus 2 level. So, I just want to repeat once more that the triple superphosphate, then the DAP, DAP is a very common fertilizer, diammonium hydrogen phosphate and then monoammonium dihydrogen phosphate MAP. So, TSP, DAP, MAP, these are the three primary fertilizers which are used and manufactured from phosphoric acid. It is also used in soft drinks, supplement in feed and detergent because it helps, okay. So, it will helps, it does not, uh, you know, it will help for the resistance with water. So, that is why they are used in soft drinks, supplement in feed and detergent. So, where are these uses? These see the fertilizer, DAP is around 8 percent use, MAP, TSP, then other fertilizers and there are other uses also. The other uses are the ones which is I have noted down here, soft drinks, supplement in feed and detergent. So, these are the different uses. If you see the primarily most of them, almost 29 plus 15, 44, I would say almost 60 percent. 60 percent is in the fertilizer sector. So, what are the lower materials? One is the bones, natural source of phosphorus or the phosphoric ores. Now, these phosphoric ores are uh, mainly where are the origin from? These form in igneous rocks or sedimentary rocks. Igneous rocks, some of the examples or places where they are mined are in the worldwide region is Kola, South Africa and Brazil and you have the sedimentary rocks because in these rocks, it is actually associated with the gang minerals. Gang minerals means unwanted, which means that it does not have any use. So, or no commercial use, you just throw it away, just get the phosphorus. So, these are all mainly associated with these rocks. These are found in Morocco, Algeria, Jordan or in USA. 
Then uh, the one which is we are talking about are the ores, this is the appetite group. What is the appetite group? Appetite group indicates ores which are fluorapatite and then you have francolite. The fluorapatite is your uh, different uh, phosphate group attached to calcium. So, it, it is found in the igneous phosphate rocks. Then francolite with the formula X, X can be of any number which is found in sedimentary phosphate rocks. So, primarily the ores from where we will mine out the phosphoric acid will be either fluorapatite or francolite. The largest reserves of phosphate are located in the big sedimentary basin. So, when we talk about the ores of phosphate, it is primarily this sedimentary phosphate rocks. So, as I told you, these phosphates are mixed with waste materials, sedimentary layers that are permeable by gang minerals. So, gang minerals means the commercially not useful products. So, it is associated with these minerals, okay. So, you have to mine them. What is the uh, reaction happening? So, this is the suppose you have the ore here. This is ore is made to react, or I will say it's the reaction may not be a good word, it may be the digest. It is made to digest with sulfuric acid to form phosphoric acid and calcium sulfate. The calcium sulfate is also known as gypsum. This may be So, you know this gypsum, it is may used to make plaster of Paris and other building materials. So, this is also a useful product. The only issue is in all this process is that it has been said that almost 1 ton, almost 1 ton of or I will say, I will just put it the other way down, 5 tons of gypsum is produced. for each ton of each ton of phosphoric acid one of H3PO4. So, you now imagine, so how much of this gypsum is produced? So, uh, the now as a chemical engineer you may ask, is, so it is a reaction where you have two different phases, one is the liquid phase sulfuric acid, another is the solid phase the gypsum, the cake cake like material. So, how do you do that? So, filtration. So, the unit operation which comes to the picture is filtration. So, here filtration will be coming and then you have the filtration drying, both will come together. So, now uh, you have uh, the you have already read the pan type filters, okay? the pan type filters. So, you want to make the entire process continuous uh, because in your undergraduate course you may have done the in your mechanical operation lab, you may have done the plate and frame filter. Huh? So, if you see, if it is not continuous, then there is no point. So, continuous process is usually applied. What you do is, you take the liquid part that is the filtrate with at various concentration, you keep it wash, you wash it with this gypsum or the cake material. So, entire process has to be conducted in and under pressure, primarily vacuum. What you do after you separate out the gypsum and the filtrate, then you just reverse it. You take it in a pressure, instead of vacuum, you apply pressure. What happens? So, whatever the cake particles are there trapped in the filter cloth material, it will come out. So, that subsequent continuous process is not disturbed. So, I will discuss this later in the next few slides. So, but the issue is this reaction, even though it looks so simple, it is not that. Problem is, as this is reacted with acid, it forms phosphoric acid, but the further production, because the further production of calcium phosphate is reduced because a calcium silicate layer forms on the surface of the ore, preventing it from further reaction with the sulfuric acid. So, what they do is, they will take a part of the phosphoric acid, I will say a weak a weak stream of phosphoric acid, they will then take it out and they will try to react with the phosphate ore such that the phosphate ore is converted almost entirely. 
so that the calcium sulfate does not deposit because if you know if it is deposited on the surface then no more reaction takes place so it becomes a rate limiting step so to avoid that what they do they'll try to circulate the phosphoric acid when they do that these reactions happen so the phosphate rock when they react with the self the phosphoric acid is a weak phosphoric acid okay it will form the what you call uh, dihydrophosphate calcium dihydrophosphate this material this salt and this re when reacts with the sulfuric acid which is already present in the digester it forms gypsum and phosphoric acid this is the only way you can go ahead that means you can make the forward reaction to be faster now the issue is this calcium sulfate now calcium sulfate can have attached one molecule of water two molecules of water half molecule of water now this is called crystallization it the crystallization will as you know you have studied in mass transfer it depends upon what is the temperature and what is the concentration so temperature and concentration is very important so as to get the equilibrium equilibrium means between whether it is hemihydrate half molecule of hto or it will get associated with two molecules of hto so that's what it is it depends upon the temperature and the concentration so let us see how it looks like so this is the equilibrium diagram so calcium sulfate equilibrium diagram on temperature and p2o5 concentration so it means the amount of p2o5 is given in the x axis and y axis is the temperature so now you are already forming p2o5 after you react with sulfuric acid so i'm writing p2o5 means it's the same as phosphoric acid it is just need to be in contact with water which is usually done in the last step so if you see uh, this is a line uh, which actually demarcates the hemihydrate hemihydrate is half and dihydrate is 2 so it is that point so if you need uh, two molecules of water to be associated you need a low temperature and a concentration well um, near about uh, 10 to 50 but primarily temperature now in between uh, this you will have the hemihydrate so hemihydrate you need higher and higher temperature primarily uh, lower uh, p2o5 and if you go above that so this is equilibrium line okay so above this you will only have dried calcium sulfate so for this you require high temperature as well as high concentration for simple calcium sulfate okay so equilibrium temperature means these points the equilibrium these are the equilibrium temperature points okay so this is the way usually uh, you proceed with the reaction so the industry will i mean they will decide on the economics of the process whether i want to go with hemihydrate or i want to go with dihydrate so even if they decide now this is the equilibrium temperature now now initially you got the plot with respect to temperature and percentage p2o5 now what is the relation of the sulfuric acid concentration so if you see these are the and several lines are drawn so these are the sulfuric acid concentration means what percentage of concentrated sulfuric acid you want to provide and which will govern the formation of hemihydrate or dihydrate so this is what it is so you see uh, if you go above 25% of sulfuric acid you will invariably get dihydrate an intermediate composition let's say 25 15 10 5 will lead to a uh, you know it is a mixture of both dihydrate as well as hemihydrate and if you go zero means that is nothing is there you concentration is very less the function of sulfuric acid concentration if it is very less but you should also have a concentration of p2o5 above this then uh, you you have calcium sulfate hemihydrate only okay so this is the way you actually conduct the process flow sheet or you design a process flow sheet so it means if i want to recall what we have learned from the previous two figures or graphs it means for dihydrate precipitation or crystallization you need this much concentration of p2o5 at this temperature and for hemihydrate so dihydrate means two molecules hemihydrate means half molecule you need to have higher amount of p2o5 and a higher temperature but there are certain issues with phosphorus rock you have fluorine also fluorine is very corrosive so what they do is the fluorine they went out through a scrubber and uh, you know you have the silica particles also inside the phosphate rock so what they do is they react with the silica particles the fluorine they form 
hydrosilica fluoric acid. I think if I am correct, the formula is something like H H two SiF six, some sort of hydrosilica hexafluoric acid. They will form. So this will form. This will come out as a vapor. So once it comes out of a vapor uh, and it reacts with silica, so you have to somehow vent it. So you cannot throw it in the atmosphere. Somehow you have to vent it or collect it. Then there are other trace materials: arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, nickel. All these have. Uh, they will form some salts with silica. Arsenic silicate, cadmium silicate, all these will be formed. So they can be taken out of the slag material at the end. Even uh, just to mention, the uranium is also present in a minor amount. So this has to be taken care. But as you know, uranium uh, not all all uranium are radioactive. The one which is two thirty five is radioactive. So isotope two thirty eight is usually found in ores. So it has to be processed two thirty five. So it is not a point of concern. The iron, aluminium, sodium, potassium, chlorine all have an effect on the process of. So these are all the trace materials which has an effect on pollution. So I'm not discussing details how the industry takes care of these process, but I will focus on the fluorine, which is one of the compound which is pretty high, two to four percent. The remaining all metals or uh, this um, other um, minerals they are in trace amounts. So now there are different processes. So as I told you, depending upon the phosphatic rocks. You have you may have the dihydrate process where two molecules. I just now explained two molecules of water per molecule of water. Hemihydrate means two molecules of compound per molecule of water. So even if I write one is to two, or I can write two is to one, or one is to half. So this can also be written as one is to half. So it means one is to half means calcium sulfate half H two O. Here what do you mean one is to two? So two molecules of water. Associated with one molecule of calcium sulfate. Now this hemihydrate process, uh, they can uh, sometimes they do in into single stage, sometimes they do in double stage. It depends, but to reduce the cost, some, most of the industries now adopt the single stage process. Okay, single stage means single stage means the digester. I'm talking about two stage, three stage, a single stage or two stage. We are talking about the digester. Then there is another process called dihemihydrate process. So it has both dihydrate as well as hemihydrate. Is usually in double stage. Then hemihydrate recrystallization process. So this will be taken up. These three will be taken up in the next lecture. But today I will focus on dihydrate. So let us go to or discuss more about this process. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Now these are the processes. Just now I discussed the dihydrate process, which I will discuss now. The here is the gypsum is precipitated as dihydrate means two times of Water, two H two O. So your formula will be something like CaSO four, two times of water. Now for the dihydrate and hemihydrate process, what they do is they conduct a acidulation. Acidulation means in the digester they treat it with acid. Acidulation is conducted under dihydrate condition. So when you do a acid, the reaction proceeds with the formation of dihydrate. But Then what they do is again, when they do a filtration, the calcium sulfate is recrystallized. Recrystallization, they do a recrystallization back to hemihydrate, to half H two. Okay, so this is that both the process. So dihydrate in the acid process, and then further crystallization back to hemihydrate process. Then come to the hemihydrate process. In the hemihydrate process, the calcium sulfate is first precipitated as hemihydrate. So in the first step, here is hemihydrate, but the phosphoric acid is separated. In the hemihydrate process, the phosphoric acid is separated, and you have the hemihydrate means half of H two O. Then this is recrystallized with more water. So if you put more water in it, it will form this same as dihydrate. This is another method. So these are all governed with the type of ore, with the type of ore constitution of the ore, the economics and the process is adopted. Then you have the hemihydrate recrystallization, recrystallization process. Here, it recrystallizes the hemihydrates to dihydrates, even before separating the hemihydrate. So here, if you see the other previous case, DHHH process, you are separating out, but it recrystallizes. So it means first hemihydrate is formed, then again you immediately recrystallize it to dihydrate. 
So whenever you talk about the risk crystallization, I am talking about the change in the operating condition. So you have to focus again back to those two plots which I have shown. So the concentration depends upon the equilibrium curve. Okay. So it what it does is it saves the filtration step. So hemi means you are uh, taking out most of the water in the single step. So you save the one single filtration step. So we will discuss about this in detail. So we will focus now primarily now on the process flow sheet for gypsum. So this is the entire dihydrate process. So what you have is um, you have the phosphate rock. This phosphate rock is grinded and uh, if it is grinded in a ball mesh and uh, almost 150 micrometer particle size because you know you have to increase its size so its area increases and it becomes ready for reaction. Then sulfuric acid as I told you, you have to select what strength of sulfuric acid you require from the equilibrium curves, okay. then water. So these are the attack tanks or acidulation tanks, same thing. So in the acidulation tank the reaction occurs. So whatever I told you, you know these the waste gases means the you have the other elements. So it will react with the acid to form some gases. The, these gases are scrubbed and then treated and then sent out. But uh, what they do is this, you know, the temperature it is exothermic, so the temperature will increase. So what they do is they take out the product, some product of this particular attack tank. They pass it through a flash cooler, so it will help to control the temperature. So it is controlling the temperature. Controlling the temperature. So it will control the temperature while it does so it can also evolve some gases which are primarily rich in fluorine. So what fluorine does is again as I told you it reacts with silica and forms the fluorosilicic acid. Okay. So it will condense and form the fluorosilicic acid. So what are the reaction happening here? This is the reaction happening here, Okay, overall reaction. So now what you do is, now why I made this blue? Because when you are sending the from the feed or not from the feed, the product from the attack tanks, it is a weak acid. Okay, it is a weak acid. So weak acid is sent to the aging tank. What is the aging tank? The aging tank is nothing, you just keep it the samples because you uh, need the gypsum crystals, you have to give sufficient residence time for the gypsum crystals to form. So this is what we call aging. So this is the aging tank. So now this is a weak phosphoric acid is formed. Now part of the weak phosphoric acid as I told you in order to prevent or to limit the reaction of this ore to inhibit the formation of calcium sulphate on this ore itself, this reaction occurs which I have shown it is calcium dihydrogen phosphate. Now this calcium hydrogen is an intermediate product, it again reacts with the sulphuric acid which is present here and it forms this calcium sulphate gypsum and the phosphoric acid which is again said. So this is a flow sheet, this is recycle loop. So recycle loop is weak phosphoric acid, this should be clear. So here is the flash cooler, you are controlling temperature of this while here you are recycling a part of the product. Okay. So then what you do, this is a major process that is the filter. Now in this part you have the solid and the liquid both coming here. So because nucleation is complete, the crystals have formed, you send it to the filtration. Now what you do is the filtration. So what is filtration? You take the help of rotating pan filters. So what you do is, uh, no, this is something which is very interesting. So you have uh, read this earlier also. So ultimately what you have is a cake product which is hemihydrate. So you should have a dot here, the hemihydrate cake and this is uh, strength of the phosphoric acid which is 26.2% P2O5. This is further sent for concentrate, it is concentrated more. So you need, at least you need to take it up to 50% of phosphorium pentoxide. But let us see what happens in rotating pan filter. So rotating pan filter means what you have is, uh, you know, you have this, uh, I mean uh, something like this, you have a circular ball here, you have the trapezoidal uh, pan kept here. Okay. So this trapezoidal pan and then you have a filter cloth underneath. So this filter cloth and trapezoidal form, these are there in all this part. 
So, it is a cycle, okay. So, you have this trapezoidal pans moving in this direction. So, these are the pans. So, this is called pan filter. So, it gets upside down. So, these are the filter cloth. So, it means when the when I talk of this arrow, it is the same arrow which is solid plus liquid comes in enters this filtration unit. In the pan filter, you apply vacuum. So, if you apply vacuum, so all the you know this cake will be deposited on the filter and the filtrate will come down, okay. The filtrate will come down, so, but you need to wash this, you need to wash it. So, whatever filtrate is coming down, you again send it on top of it, okay. It again goes and top of it, you keep it washing, you keep it washing under vacuum. So, that the entire crystals or the entire cake of gypsum comes out. So, once it comes out, it will it comes in this direction it falls down, the cake will falls down. So, this is what the cake comes out as a byproduct, this one, gypsum, okay. So, gypsum comes out here, gypsum. And the remaining filtrate after this washing is complete, at this point, you can say at this point, instead of vacuum, what you do? You put a pressure wise air. So, when you do a pressure air blow, what happens? Any suspended solid particle which is present on the filter medium comes out because you need to send this out because otherwise if any of the suspended particles is present here, the, the gypsum particles present here, in this process it will be blocking the filter medium. So, the process cannot be continuous in nature. So, to avoid that you just invert the pressure and pass air to discharge the cake as well as to remove any suspended particles. This is exactly what happens in the dihydrate filter. Now, let us see how we concentrate this 2632 to at least 50 percent. We need at least 50 percent of this P2O5. So, this is the as I told you what are the different process I have already discussed. So, first you grind it at this size, then you reaction, do a reaction with sulfuric acid to convert phosphoric acid and insoluble calcium sulfate. That is the main reaction, then filtration. So, here you form dihydrate then concentration. So, what we are now focusing here is the concentration unit, this one, this entire process flow sheet. Now, this comes from the previous flow sheet, the phosphoric acid of this strength. So, what you do is a heat exchanger is there, so exchanges heat, steam is sent here. So, that, so then uh, you send this steam and the phosphoric acid to a evaporator body. So, when you evaporate the body, it gets concentrated. So, it is get concentrated and you get the desired product of almost close to 54 percent of product acid having 54 percent P2O5. Then what you do? You separate out. You will have still have some, let us say you will have some weak acid remaining. This weak acid is again sent back, but in this evaporator again you will form some, you know, some other, uh, the, you know, some fluorine atom may be present, fluorine or other atom like uh, lead, arsenic, all these things may present in minute amount. So, it means that uh, when you do evaporation, they will come out to the condenser. So, what you do is with the condenser, uh, so then uh, you do reject it to a barometric seal. What do you mean by the barometric seal? The low pressure drain. Basically, it is a low pressure drain means low pressure uh, went out. So, the low pressure drain here you actually collect all the remaining impurities and the remaining so, so because you apply vacuum on top of it and the remaining waste gas may be passed again back to the scrubber and sent in the atmosphere after necessary uh, recovery, okay. So, this is the entire system. So, uh, the evaporator here getting affected with a direct contact with acid. So, uh, one common uh, one thing you should remember is this evaporator body is a single effect. Why it is single effect? Because there are two reasons, there is a huge elevation in boiling point, huge elevation in boiling point and corrosive, these are the two reasons why you have a corrosive because the acid produced is highly corrosive in nature. So, because of the elevation in boiling point and the corrosive nature of corrosive nature of acid, you do not do a multiple effect 
evaporator you do it in a single effect evaporator because the evaporator body is then made by you know graphite or something like that graphite lining so that it can withstand such high concentration of acid so this is what you have so finally the product is removed here the remaining gases is sent back again and again it is made in contact with the steam and the phosphoric acid at the feed then you separate out then the amount which is left is the weak acid sent it back to the system to the previous flow sheet or you can to weak acid means you can again send it back to the digester if you want finally you condense out the remaining impurities by treating by adding water and send out the low pressure reject to the barometric seal so this is the process actually for the dihydrate the in the next lecture what i will do i will uh, explain you the hemihydrate and the recrystallization process which actually takes the advantage of dihydrate as well as hemihydrate so it is adopted in such a manner to improve the economics of the process so let us see what are the advantages primarily there is no phosphate rock quality in the dihydrate process this is very important there is no rock phosphate rock quality limitation operating temperatures are pretty low here start up and shut down of the plant are easy even wet rock can be used so it you don't need to dry it you don't need to dry the ore before you send it to the plant so these are the four advantages but the disadvantages as i saw you is that this is requires additional step which is the concentration step so the overall process which you get is only 2632% p2o5 so high energy consumption so you need a very pretty high energy in the acid concentration so when you do the acid concentration in the case of the evaporator i mean here i am taking talking about the evaporator the additional step so in the additional step in the evaporator you need to provide lot of energy so that's what we say it's a high energy consumption and some losses are also there in the case of the process flow sheet previous flow sheet um, almost 4 to 6% p2o5 actually during the filtration step they may co crystallize with the calcium sulfate and taken out as gypsum so some losses is also present so these to overcome these losses we actually have moved to the other processes the hemihydrate and the recrystallization process so you should follow this production of phosphoric acid booklet 4 of 8 is the european fertilizer manufacturing association uh, printed by fisher print limited petersburg england and you may also have a right to look at this book written by sri kumar kokial who himself uh, has been in the industrial person this chemical process technology and simulation so it will also talk since simulation is not a part of our course syllabi so simulation also talks that if you have the reaction how you can simulate this entire process in commercial process software packages such as aspen so that has been covered very nicely so you should follow this book also for primarily for this phosphoric acid so it's a prentis hall of india publication uh, thank you mm -hmm.